BioCentury This Week is brought to you by Jato Capital, a global leading independent private equity fund dedicated to biopharma. Jato Capital has built a patient benefit driven approach aimed at financing and accelerating the development of groundbreaking medical innovation. Jato's unique investment strategy combines significant capital and expert support to companies and their management teams ranging from clinical development to market access for cutting edge innovations with one main objective, go faster for the patient. Learn more at jato.life. Welcome to BioCentury This Week, the podcast with BioCentury's editorial team. We're talking drug development, policy, financing, regulatory issues, everything that fits into the biopharma space. I'm Jeff Cranmer, one of the executive editors here at BioCentury, and joining me today are my colleagues. Simone Fishben, Editor-in-Chief. Lauren Martz, Executive Director of Biopharma Intelligence. And Steve Austin, Washington Editor. On today's podcast, FDA's Peter Marks outlines plans to energize gene therapy and hopes for gene editing. We'll also talk about a billion dollar commitment by a large VC syndicate to a new AI guided therapeutics developer. And we'll look at the big deal of the day, Ono's takeout of Desafira. And we'll also talk a little bit about our upcoming Bioequity Europe conference, which will be taking place in Basque Country in the middle of May. First up, FDA is advancing a set of policies that are intended to help gene therapies overcome speed bumps that are slowing progress in bringing new therapies to patients with rare diseases. Peter Marks discussed this last week on a webinar hosted by the Alliance for a Stronger FDA. Peter Marks, of course, the director of FDA's Center for biologics evaluation and research. Steve, you tuned in. What did you learn? Well, first, I want to start out with kind of a shout out for the Alliance. They do really great webinars with excellent people at FDA, and they let them talk long enough to get past the sound bites um, that you get in other places. So it was really interesting. There were two sets of issues from Peter Marks that I thought were important. One, he's concerned that gene therapies are stuttering or not exactly stalled, but they're not living up to their potential. And he discussed the things CBRS doing and will do to try to advance the field to bring gene therapies to more patients more quickly. And the second thing he talked about is his enthusiasm for gene editing and the contributions he thinks the technology could make to medicine over the next five to 10 years. On accelerated approval, he noted that there are gene therapies that have dropped out and they've been dropped not because they didn't seem to be safe and effective, but because of Um, concerns. Well, he didn't say it, but the concerns are because of the regulatory pathway and because of of the financial issues. And he talked about two different things I think that were really important. One is he talked about the platform technology designation guidance. That's a guidance that is actually overdue. According to the law, FDA should have had it done at the end of December. If it works as the way it's supposed to work, it's going to allow companies to refer to their previous approvals to a lot of the data that were in their previous approvals when they're having a technology that iterates on an existing technology. Gene therapy is a really good example of that, where the vectors and the manufacturing and some of the other issues are likely to be the same between products. And if the designation works the way that it's supposed to work, it should make it less expensive, more predictable, and faster to get new gene therapies approved into patients. And the other thing that he talked about was the use of accelerated approval for gene therapies. And he said something which he said um, several times in the past, including in a, uh, an interview, a video interview that BioCentury did with him, that he intends to lean on accelerated approval to get gene therapies to patients more quickly than would have been possible without it. I think it's incredibly interesting what Peter Marx is doing, not just the substance of it, but a higher level, the fact that he is continuing to push for this. I was at the USAIC, USA India Chamber of Commerce meeting in Boston last week with really a lot of leading people in the industry. And it is extraordinary the degree to which 
his name has actually become associated with the progress in drug development of gene therapies. He is widely, widely credited for continuing to push for enabling, and we're going to hear about another one from Lauren in a minute, but enabling a lot of these therapies to move forward and get over the finish line. So I, I think it is very interesting and important that he's continuing to sort of wave the flag for gene therapies and certainly enable drug developers to move ahead, thinking around all of these obstacles. That is what the drug development industry or the biotech industry wants from its regulators. You know, it was interesting. He said something I think that people will find controversial. I think it's really emblematic of the way that he thinks about it. He was talking about using accelerated approval for gene therapies. And he said, and this is a quote from him, the way I would look at this is at the end of three years, if one in 20 times we end up finding out that a product didn't work, but 19 out of 20, we find out that some kids are alive now that wouldn't have been alive, or some kids are walking now that wouldn't have been walking, or some kids can actually read who wouldn't otherwise be able to. I'm not going to lose any sleep. So he's basically, he's explicitly saying, look, he's willing to take the risk that they're going to approve something. He has the expectation that they're going to approve something that isn't going to work. FDA is going to be pilloried for that. But he says it's worth it if it's only one out of 20 times. All right. Well, one of the latest developments in the gene therapy space was, I believe, Friday's approval of the Pfizer gene therapy for hemophilia B. And I wanted to bring in Lauren now and just ask her, how is Pfizer working to ensure access to this new therapy? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So this is the second gene therapy, AAB-based gene therapy approved for hemophilia B. Hemgenics from CSL and Unicor was approved over a year ago. And in this case, you know, we see the same price that, that we saw with that last approval, which is a, a high price for the one-time therapy at $3.5 million. But so this is the latest example of a company saying that they are going to use some form of innovative pricing reimbursement model to help get this gene therapy to patients and address the burden that the increasing number of gene therapies may have on payers. So we don't know any details about what exactly they're offering, but Pfizer says that they will have a warranty program, which is distinct from what CSL has for its gene therapy, which is distinct from what CSL is offering for their gene therapy, which is value-based contracts. Um, so we know that CSL has agreements where if patients do not respond to this gene therapy and, and they're classifying a non-response as requiring factor nine treatments during the first four years after they receive this gene therapy, they'll get reimbursed a certain amount of money. I think it's interesting. Hemophilia is really kind of a, a great use case, both for gene therapy and for these kind of warranties or value-based contracts. Because one, you know, people know that it's going to be extremely expensive to treat these patients going forward. And you know how much it's going to be, you know, how much the factor nine replacement therapies cost. So you know that you're saving a great deal of money if they work. And then you have something that's relatively easy to measure to determine whether the gene therapy is working the way that it's supposed to work. Steve, I think there's actually even a sort of level beyond that in which the hemophilias are important because everybody in the public has heard of hemophilia. They all can understand what that is. They can all understand the idea or concept of a gene therapy uh, I think they can also for things like sickle cell disease and certain, you know, diseases like that. And so we know that these conversations about pricing are going to interface with the public domain. And so these are really important diseases and an important vehicle also to flesh out the sort of constructs of pricing that Lauren's been talking about. And it's going to be really interesting to see how the market responds to this difference between a warranty and a value-based contract, it gets really nerdy really quickly to try to explain what the differences are. But I think it's going to be important to see how that plays out in, in the real world. Steve, quickly, you also wrote a piece last week about a new report from ICER and New Digs that suggest strategies and reforms to help payers adjust to one-time therapies. Uh, what was important about this report? Well, you know, talk about getting nerdy really quickly. The, the report was really very detailed. Uh, it talked about the innovative financing models that exist for gene therapies 
and what policies government could put in place and the private sector could implement that would make them work better. My biggest takeaway from the report is that it's a tractable problem. The scale's large, but it's not immense. It's probably a tenth the size in terms of cost to the healthcare system of obesity drugs. And there are solutions available. More work needs to be done to make those solutions function well, but there are things like warranties, there are things like reinsurance that are already available and that need to be put into effect, especially to ensure equity and access. That's one of the points that they make in the report that I thought was really important. The big payers, CMS, for example, or the big insurance companies have programs in place that are going to provide pretty good coverage for the gene therapies that are available now. But employer-provided health plans, especially the smaller ones, may not, and they need to do things like take advantage of insurance pools or reinsurance programs so that they can make these therapies available to their employees and ensure that there's equitable access. Because, you know, the report points out, it says that people's access to life-sustaining gene therapies shouldn't be determined by who they work for or where they get their insurance. All right. Thanks for that, Steve. You can find links to Steve's Peter Mark story and the Icer Newdig story in the show notes or on our website, of course. Uh, I'd like to shift gears now. We have our colleague Josh Berlin joining us all the way from Virginia. And Josh is our head of business development here at BioCentury. Those of you who attend our conferences in China and Singapore, around Europe, and our new one coming up in Nashville, Tennessee in the fall. You'll know Josh already, I'm sure. He heads up our conferences, and he's here to talk to us today to tell us a little bit about the Bioequity Europe conference. It's the 24th time we've put this conference on. We, we only missed uh, the pandemic year one year, but beyond that, we attract a lot of great biotechs from across Europe, a lot of top VCs who come to talk about what's happening in European biotech. So let me turn it over to Josh, and uh, we can learn a little bit more about what to expect at this year's conference, which is May 12th to 14th in San Sebastian. Josh, welcome to the pod. Yeah, Jeff and team, thanks for having me. Really uh, love listening to the pod each week, so it's great to be here. Bottom line is we are very close to selling out this event. So Jeff mentioned it's May 12th to 14th in San Sebastian. If you haven't been there, it's a beautiful city right on the Atlantic Ocean, foodie capital of the world, or at least one of them. And we are close to selling out. So if you do want to attend, please check out our website. Do not wait. It's bioequityeurope.com. If you don't know bioequity, it's, it's really a destination event for biotech CEOs and investors. It's a place where folks network, partner, and debate critical issues facing the industry in an intimate setting. So this isn't a 15,000 person event. You know, we do expect to have a sold out event, but there'll be plenty of opportunities for folks to get to know each other and learn from each other. I did want to give a shout out to our regional host chair. Uh, each year we have a regional host chair. That's UCS Capital, the Spanish VC this year. Um, in terms of attendance, we have over 300 biotech CEOs registered over 250 VC and investors registered, 150 biotech C-suite registered as well. And what I think bioequity is most known for is the C-level networking, is getting the opportunity to talk with these folks over three shared days in the city. And uh, couldn't be more pleased with where we are in terms of registration. And again, would, would love to have those still interested to go ahead and register. I think what else bioequity is known for is introducing new biotechs to investors and pharma BDNL leaders. So this year, thanks to the efforts of Jeff and others on the team, we have 150 biotechs, a little over that, uh, scheduled to present, and more than 50% of those are new to the bioequity stage. So it's really a great opportunity to get to know some new co's, get to know their CEOs, uh, get to hang out with them and hear what they have to say. The other thing I would say is we have a theme each year. This year's theme is how biotechs can rise above the noise to attract the right investors, partners, and talent. And the BioCentury editorial team, I think, has put together a fantastic agenda this year, just a who's who of the industry speaking. Please check out our website if you want to see the full list 
of the faculty. Also wanted to highlight there are two conference reports related to this event. Our insights partner, McKinsey, produces a report each year on the biotech industry in Europe. Everyone always looks forward to their data. And Simone and team are working on the famous uh, BioCentury scene setter report, which uh, we will also be issuing at the, the conference. That's also a uh, famous report. Uh, we won't be issuing it. I guess I should say we'll be uh, previewing it at the conference. Uh, but that'll be a preview during uh, the opening plenary session that, that Simone will moderate. So really, really looking forward to seeing folks in San Sebastian. And please send us an email if you have any questions or check out our website and um, hope to see you in San Sebastian. Yeah. So uh, on those presenting companies, handpicked by me, Simone, some of the other members of the editorial team, and going through that process, which has lasted uh, several months, it was really just impressive the depth of innovation we are finding among these companies founded in the past two, three, four years, whether they're from Norway, whether they're from Spain or around the UK. We've got some great companies for you to check out. So do check out the list. Do head to see the presenting companies. But we also have a pretty great program for you. And I know Simone is hosting not one, but two fireside chats. Simone, uh, who are you chatting with? Yeah, among the things I'm doing at BioEquity, I have two fireside chats that I'm extremely excited about. One of them is with Kate Bingham. I'm sure our listeners will remember that Kate is not only managing partner at SV Health Investors, but also led the UK's vaccine task force and was really seminal actually in the pandemic in bringing vaccines to the UK. She also has a lot of leadership lessons and I will be talking to her at an investor network breakfast that is co-sponsored by B7% and Level 20. And so she will be speaking to an audience of uh, interested in young investors as well. And after that, later on, I will be speaking in a fireside chat with Mike White of HSBC, which I'm sure everybody remembers, bought SVB, Silicon Valley Bank in the UK after that episode, shall we call it? And we'll be talking a lot about the finance landscape and what it's been like since that acquisition. So I think those are going to be two really interesting ones. The second one is called a happy hour fireside chat which means it comes with a drink of wine. All right. Well, you can uh, learn more by clicking on the link in the show notes. Arch and Foresight opened a lot of eyes very wide last week when they announced the launch of a new AI biotech with $1 billion in committed capital. Steve, you caught up with Arch's Bob Nelson. What did you learn? So I, I had a really fascinating conversation. It's always fascinating to talk to Bob Nelson uh, about the company. One of the things that he emphasized, I thought was really important. He said repeatedly, he said, this isn't a service company. It's not an AI company. They're building a drug company. And it's going to be energized by a big focus on AI and using AI to try to revamp the way that they do everything from discovery to clinical trials to development. Yeah, this also dovetails with last week's USAIC meeting where I met some of the uh, leaders actually of that company. It also dovetails with this really rising conversation around AI in drug development. In this case, it's largely being applied to the discovery phase. But, you know, as we're going to be covering it more and more, it has a lot of applications beyond that. And to Steve's point, this is a drug development company. They will be using AI and ML, and it'll be really interesting to see how they apply those technologies, but it's about making drugs. Yep, and we'll have a profile of the company by our colleague, Karen Takach tusman in the coming weeks. All right, let's turn to Ono's big deal. Lauren, uh, you took a quick look at this. Uh, I know our colleague, Paul Bananos, is writing... The story, which will be out today. Ono, oh why Desafira? Well, Ono has talked about this push to become a global organization. I think this is a step toward that. The company has 
a product on the market and one that has completed phase three trials and is seeking U.S. approval. These are both cancer therapies. I think the other issue here is that, you know, we've seen from the last quarter that about half of Ono's revenues are coming from Optivo, um, the product that's marketed by BMS, the PD-1 inhibitor, and loss of exclusivity there starts in 2028. You know, I think the company is is looking to fill some of the gaps that will, will be left there. Yep. So these drugs, one is already approved, one is on the brink of an FDA submission, and Let's see, Desafira, located in Waltham, Massachusetts, certainly helps the company expand its footprint. I think the company has about 150 employees there. And then it also has some employees based in Switzerland and in Kansas. So it will be interesting to watch Ono. Of course, Obdivo, by now a household name, but... uh Ono needs to uh, start looking beyond it. And clearly uh, with this deal, it is taking a big step in that direction. All right. Well, special thanks to Josh for joining us. Even though he's a Washington Commanders fan, we uh, do allow him onto the podcast occasionally. And uh, I can't wait for the tennis season to heat back up because, uh, Simone, I'm, I'm, you know, I just haven't gotten any good news out of you from, uh, from the mean courts. And uh, I know you're eager to, to discuss that second in your heart only after biotech. All right. Thanks for tuning in. We will catch you next week. And next week, we'll also have a special edition of the BioCentury This Week podcast. We'll be joined by guests from McKinsey and Yeesios to talk about rising above the noise for biotech in Europe and our Bioequity Europe conference. And as Josh said, we're about to sell out. We'd love to see you there. So uh, register and you'll get to hear uh, Simone's Fireside Chats. Karen Koch tusman will be there. Stephen Hansen will be there. And of course, Josh will be there serving wine and leading the golf outing, uh, I think. You're on the golf outing, right, Josh? I'm going to be at the museum outing, but uh, we do have David Flores, BioCentury CEO on the golf pitch. So please uh, come out and join us. With his set of 50-year-old wooden clubs that he loves to play with. Maybe they'll have some rentals for him. All right. <laughs> uh, good, good thing Dave doesn't listen to the podcast. Uh, all right. We'll catch you next week. Thanks for tuning in. BioCentury would like to thank Jato Capital for its continued support of our BioCentury This Week podcast and our 24th annual BioEquity Europe Conference this May in San Sebastian.